This happened when I was 14 years old. I'll never forget it, however, and it still haunts me to this day. Although I lived in town, I had a friend who lived out in the country when I was in school. I'd been over to his house many times, and I always envied him in a way. He lived much farther away from most people, and I thought he probably enjoyed that peace far better. The house that he lived in was pretty great too. His dad is a carpenter, and I guess he had mostly built it himself. It was very amazing for such a small crude project. It had plenty of rooms and was a lot more modern looking than many of the older townhouses were even. My friend Eric even had a satellite dish. That was a pretty big deal back in the day. It was one of those really big dishes you might see around, not like one of the small direct TV ones that are around now. You could get all sorts of channels from all over the world, which was really cool. Hanging out at Eric's house was always a really fun thing to do. When I was 14 years old, Eric decided to have a sleepover at his house all weekend after school. It was going to be exceptionally fun because his parents were not going to be home all day on Saturday. So the five of us, four friends and Eric, would have the run of the place for the entire day. For a few 14-year-old boys, having a house out in the country all to yourself was definitely something to look forward to. We had a pretty good time on Friday night. We watched movies and had pizza together. We also played some video games. This happened quite a while ago though, back in the original NES days. We didn't have the same access to the games you'd have now. It was exciting for a while, however, by Saturday when we were left all alone in the house, we were a bit bored and we were itching for something else to do. Eric had a lot of laser tag equipment that we often played with. If you aren't familiar with what that is, it's a game where everyone wears a sensor and carries a little light gun. If you fire the gun in the right spot, it sets off the sensor and that person is out of the game. We played it very often, but a few of us were looking to try something different than what we usually did. All of us visiting thought it would be fun to go out into the woods and do the laser tag like a game of hide and seek. There was so much woods out there that it would be a whole new world to hide in. We could play a game that lasted for hours and hours if we did it right. The only problem was that Eric's parents didn't like he or us heading out into the hills like that. They didn't own that property, although Eric's dad did know who did. First off, going into that wooded area would be trespassing. They were also worried there might be dangerous animals out there, and there was the possibility of getting lost as well. With them being gone all day though, there was no need to worry about getting caught. The parents would not return until the following morning, so as long as no one stepped into a bear trap or got tangled up in barbed wire or something, we figured we would be okay. We had a really fun time out in the woods. We could hang out in a tree to attack each other, hide behind rocks, or even lay on the ground and cover ourselves in leaves for camouflage. Since it was fall, the leaves had been falling pretty heavily, so there was a lot to work with. We kept up playing the game a lot and eventually lost track of time. It didn't matter though, because we were having such a great time. It was sometime in the late afternoon that something odd happened though. We were playing around and everyone had been found, except for my friend Rodney. Eric was it, and we weren't supposed to help him find Rodney. However, after a while of searching for him, we began to think he must have chosen way too good of a hiding place, so all four of us began to openly search for him. We tried calling out for him, letting him know that he was safe because he'd found such a good spot. This was a way of trying to entice him to come out of hiding, but it didn't work. We were at first under the impression that Rodney was just trying to milk his good hiding skills for as long as possible. We certainly didn't think that something may have happened to him. However, as we looked around for him more and more, and he didn't run out and yell and surprise us or something, we began to think that something may have happened to him. Maybe he had fallen and broken something or been knocked out somehow. 
As far as we know, there could have been dangerous snakes out there and he could have gotten bit. There were just a whole lot of things we didn't know, but we were pretty sure we would be able to find him. All of our confidence went down significantly when we noticed the light was beginning to go away. Eric had never been out in the woods before like this, so we couldn't count on him knowing his way around to help us find Rodney. It was going to be even worse once we didn't have any light. We redoubled our efforts, but began to get very worried about this. We sent Eric back to the house to get some flashlights, while we continued looking. We didn't think about how stupid it was to try splitting up, especially when it began to get dark outside, but we weren't exactly thinking rationally at that point. A friend of ours was literally missing, while we were out doing something we were never supposed to be doing. If we didn't find him, who knows what would happen to the guy? To a lesser extent, we were also pretty worried about what was going to happen to us either way. Eric got back with the flashlights, and we continued to look for Rodney well after the sun went completely down. It was very difficult doing so, of course, without being able to see far ahead of us. It was also scary enough without it being dark, but even more so with it being completely pitch black and being all alone. Every step was terrifying especially when you consider the imagination of a 14-year-old boy trying to imagine what the different reasons may be that Rodney had disappeared. Suddenly, I heard one of the other guys screaming. I couldn't figure out based off the sound who it was, though. I could tell the direction it was coming from. I began running as fast as I could in that direction. After a while, I was able to hear and eventually see my other friends running towards the scream, too. I figured out it was our buddy Adam who had screamed and was now running towards us. We stopped him because we wanted him to explain to us why he was panicking. He was utterly terrified, however. He didn't want to talk. He just kept wanting to run off towards the house. We couldn't reason with him at all. This boy was seriously scared to death. Eric, I, and the third boy Lonnie agreed to let him go back to the house and we would continue to look around for Rodney. We kept looking and looking and I don't really know how long we were out there. However, there had to be a point when we realized things weren't going to be going our way and we needed to get the adults involved. That's when the three of us gave up our search and headed back to the house. Once we were there, Eric called the police and let them know that Rodney had disappeared several hours ago and we hadn't been able to find him at all. It was only when the police had gotten there that we realized what had scared Adam so bad. He had seen a guy out there in the woods, a huge, scary-looking guy. The guy had rushed towards him when he saw him. Based on Adam's description of the scary man, the police had a pretty good idea of who it was. There was an old man who lived in a shack further up on the hills. He was basically a hermit and didn't have much contact with other people. When Adam saw the guy later, he confirmed it was the man he had seen rushing at him. That was a new for me, Eric, and Lonnie, because after Adam had fled, we had still been out there in the dark with that scary man, but we hadn't seen him at all. There was no doubt in any of our minds he had something to do with Rodney's disappearance. The man was never charged with anything, of course. Rodney was never found either. There was no real evidence he was kidnapped or killed or anything like that. All subsequent searches turned up no evidence. It was eventually decided that Rodney ran away from home, and he used a laser tag game as a way to stage his disappearance. That never sat very well with me, however. I mean, it didn't make sense. He would have had to have decided to run away that day, since we only decided to play the game that day. With no body or anything ever being found, though, it was the only explanation for what could have happened to him. I really liked going out with my cousins along the creek in order to skip some rocks. The only issue was that we had to walk along the stream for a really long time, until we came to the part of the creek that was as wide as a pond. And that was the place where the creek was surrounded by rocks we could use to skip across. It was quite a walk, but we went out and did it all the time. 
I think we may have been about 12 on this fall day, that we once again decided to go to the creek and skip rocks, or maybe try to find and collect salamanders. The first reason I'll always remember that day is because it felt like the first real day of fall that year. Not only were leaves falling from the trees as if it were raining outside, but it had gotten chilly for the first time that year. I remember being told that we had to put our jackets on if we were going out. The day was going along pretty much like any other day, with us going out to the creek. One of my cousins had brought a jar that he used to try and catch salamanders into. Out of the three of us, he kept falling behind as we walked along the creek. Once we got there, that cousin kept on looking for salamanders, but wasn't having any luck with it. Looking back, I wonder if that might have something to do with the weather, but I can't really say for sure. The other two of us kept finding rocks and skipping them, trying to see who could skip them the farthest. We did that back and forth for a while, nothing really out of the ordinary happening. Eventually though, up ahead of the creek, we saw something we never expected. There was a man of some sorts just walking along the bank. He was on the other side of where we were, and once he noticed us, he started moving even faster. The man looked like some old hillbilly you would see in a movie, and not the sort of person any of us were used to seeing in real life. He was ragged and dirty, and as he got closer, we noticed he had a really scraggly and long, unkempt beard. He was sort of a creepy-looking guy, honestly, but we didn't give that very much mind. The guy walked over to the thinner and shallower part of the creek and crossed over. He was obviously trying to come and get over to us and do something. We were somewhat guarded, but still not worried. And 12 year old boys often have a whole lot of bravado, and we didn't think we had anything to be scared of. As the guy got closer though, we realized just how disgusting he really was. He didn't have any teeth and he smelled worse than anything I had ever smelled at that age. All in all, we didn't really know how to react to him, other than being somewhat cautious. The man called out to us, in the scariest old voice I'd ever heard. Hey there, I want to show you something. He kept motioning over to the way he had come from. He tried to convince us to follow him, to see whatever this was, then turned and started walking off. Turning around after noticing that we hadn't followed him, the man looked pretty confused. He stepped back towards us and tried to get us to follow him again. He kept going on and on about having something he really wanted to show us, but we wouldn't get to see it if we didn't hurry up and follow him. That attempt wouldn't last though. When we didn't react at all, he walked over to my cousin Jimmy. Jimmy was the one who was looking for the salamanders. The man grabbed him by the arm and began to pull him away. He kept going on and on about wanting to show us something, but by that point, there wasn't a whole lot of what he was saying that any of us could make out. Plus, once he had grabbed onto Jimmy, we weren't really paying much attention to what he was saying anymore. We were just worried our cousin was in some trouble now. Jimmy was definitely scared. He began yelling and struggling to get away from this scary guy, However, the guy had a firm grip on him, and he wasn't about to let go. He succeeded in dragging Jimmy a few feet, before either of us were able to have a chance to react. Once we were able to, though, me and my cousin picked up the rocks we had been skipping and started to throw them at the man who had a grip on our cousin. Several of the rocks landed solid hits on him, but he didn't let go until I threw a particularly sharp one just like I was skipping it. It hit the old guy in the forehead, and he fell over and let go of Jimmy. Jimmy ran over to the two of us. The man leapt up, this time sounding very angry. We were able to see his face clearly, and I could tell the rock I had thrown had deeply cut into his face. He was bleeding pretty badly. We could also tell how angry he was because he started screaming at us, then started stumbling towards us. He was falling down over and over though. We didn't need to talk about it any further. The three of us began running as fast as we could, and we didn't look back at all. We didn't want to see how close that scary old guy was to catching us. The scenario was already scary enough thinking about it, 
We didn't look back before we got to the dirt road that led back to my house, and we didn't see him anywhere. We were honestly so scared that we didn't even tell my parents what had happened. Being young boys, we thought that if we just didn't talk about it, we could make it seem like it never happened. Naive, I know, but no one ever found out what happened, and we never found out what happened to the old guy. I never really felt bad about it either. I mean, if he hadn't taken hold of Jimmy the way he did, I wouldn't have had to throw rocks at him. So, we never blamed anyone but him. Still though, I hope we didn't severely injure the man. The very first time I ever lived out in the country happened when I was 13 years old. My parents were going through a particularly nasty divorce and they were doing their best to limit my exposure to the whole thing. I suppose that in retrospect it was the one good thing that came out of the divorce. They were trying to show me love and consideration. So I went to stay with my aunt out in the country. She was a very nice lady who was married to a very nice guy. They also had a very nice son too. I enjoyed being there greatly, even though it was a bit of a culture shock to me. I was so used to living in a suburban area that nothing was like that in the place where they lived. I was used to living somewhere with a whole lot of people constantly around. It was much different than that though. If you sat down on the porch all day, there might be one or two cars driving down the road you could wave your hands at, and that was about all the people you would ever see. My cousin Brian and I, most of our interaction with other people was us simply interacting with each other. The house that was the closest to my aunt's house was this big Victorian looking one. It was completely out of place with all the other buildings in the area. I suppose that made sense though, as it was supposedly much older. According to Brian and his parents, the house was long abandoned and had been sitting empty as long as they had known about it. It did obviously look like it was abandoned too, and we never saw anyone there. Brian and I used to go out and do some stuff during the day though, and one evening while we were walking home, we walked by that big old house. As we did, we noticed there was smoke coming from the chimney. It seemed really strange to us, and we mentioned it to my aunt and uncle when we got home. They said it wasn't that unusual though. Maybe whoever owned the home came by every now and then and lit the furnace to keep the house from getting too moldy or something like that. I can't remember what their exact reasoning was. The next night though, we noticed the smoke coming from the chimney again. We thought it was weird that we could see it two nights in a row if what my aunt had suggested was correct. This time, we didn't mention it to her when we got home. The two of us just talked about it amongst ourselves instead. We came up with a lot of silly stories between the two of us as to why it could have been like that, but we didn't take it seriously. We just simply considered it something interesting to talk about. I didn't think about it again until a few days later on, when Brian and I were outside once more. We walked by and noticed the smoke again. We decided that maybe we should go up to the house and check out what this was. This was an odd occurrence, and we hadn't considered it up until that point. There was no vehicle in the driveway that we could see. We wanted to get close enough to the house to figure out what was going on. Brian and I got right up to the porch when we suddenly heard the sounds of a woman screaming. She was screaming out in bloody terror as if she were being murdered in that moment. Brian and I got scared and we ran off to the road. We then ran home as quickly as possible and when we got there, we told my uncle what we experienced. He went off to check it out while my aunt called the police. It was a while before my uncle got back to us but when he did, he said there was no one there. There was no indication there had been anyone there, much less any evidence of anyone being attacked. And finally, the wood-burning stove was now completely cold, and there was no indication it had been used any time recently. There was no physical evidence of all the things Brian and I had witnessed. My aunt and uncle didn't accuse us of lying. They believed that we experienced everything we did, they just assumed there was another explanation 
something more supernatural. I don't really believe that, though. We didn't get in trouble for lying, and to this day, Brian and I will both confirm we didn't make any of this up. We saw the smoke rising, and we heard the screaming, too, but we could never find any evidence it actually happened. So now that the case is over and I can talk about it freely, I figured I would share my story of the time I was abducted. This happened in 2021. I was 20 at the time and had just gotten off work around 11pm. I went straight home to get ready to go out and meet my friend at the strip club. He'd messaged me via Facebook Messenger to hang out and smoke and I told him I was meeting someone else and didn't really want to hang out that night, so he offered to drive me to and from. Well, around 12.30, he arrived to pick me up and said he had to take out some garbage first. He had a couch on the back of the pickup truck bed, which I assume was the garbage he was talking about. He said he'd made us some margaritas as well, but I told him I didn't want to drink till I got to my destination. We ended up just smoking marijuana on the way to dump the couch instead. It was about a 25 to 30 minute car ride to where he wanted to dump this couch. By the time we'd made it to the destination, it was already 1.15 a.m. There was a logging road just off the side of the highway that went on for miles. He pulled all the way down to the end and left the couch there then got back in the truck and started driving back towards the highway. Once we'd gotten about halfway back to the highway though, he stopped, put his truck in park, then pulled out a pipe and started smoking more marijuana. After taking a hit, he turned his head to me and stared at me for a full minute with this weird smirk on his face. All of a sudden, he almost looked like he wanted to jump at me but stopped himself in the moment, with his hands in a motion as if he was about to grab me. I was getting scared at this point. I was frozen in shock, not knowing if he was just joking around or not. I quickly realized it was not a joke, though. I opened my door like I was about to get out, and he did the same. I closed my door and he closed his, too. We ended up doing this door tag back and forth until he eventually got tired of it and got out of the truck and ran to my side. He threw open my door and tried to pull me out by my legs. As I was trying to kick him, I pulled my phone out to call the police. Of course, my face ID didn't want to work in that moment though, and he ended up smacking the phone right out of my hands. I kicked him hard enough in the chest that he flew backwards, falling onto his butt. I grabbed my purse and hopped out of the truck. I started running towards the highway. I kept looking back to see how far behind me he was. He gave me a bit of a head start before chasing after me, grabbing me by the back of my shoulders when he caught up and forcibly throwing me into a ditch. I landed on my stomach with one leg straight out and the other bent at a weird angle. He jumped on top of my legs and held my left hand behind my back. I screamed and begged him to bring me home and said I wouldn't tell anyone. He got upset that I was screaming and tried suffocating me with his other hand while holding my left behind my back. I kept trying to pull his hands off my face with my right hand. It was getting to the point where I couldn't really breathe. Finally, he let go of my face. I turned my head around to see what he was doing, and to my surprise, I watched him pull zip ties out of his front jeans pocket. He zip tied my hands behind my back, and then tried to forcibly pull my undergarments off me. I had a skirt on and was laying on my stomach. I remember digging my knees into the ground so he couldn't do it. He got up and started pacing around after he failed. He started muttering to himself, It shouldn't have to happen this way. Just do what I say. I cried, telling him that if he was going to do anything to me, then to put me back in the truck first. He did. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this part of the story, but I noticed as soon as we got back to the truck, he pulled out a small Ziploc baggie containing a single condom. I asked him what he was doing, and he said he was going to need protection. 
After all that went down, he got back in the truck. Mind you, I was still tied up. He drove back to the highway and just started driving around. I made up every excuse to get him to take these off me, but of course he would not. At one point, I asked for a cigarette. I don't even smoke. He lit one, smoked on it for a bit, then held it up to my mouth saying, I'll hold it for you. At this point, I was just thinking, what can I do to get myself out of this situation? I really thought I was going to die. I started saying anything I could, like, you can be my sugar daddy. I'll pay to take us out to dinner tomorrow. If sex is the only thing you wanted from me, you could have just said that. He loved it so much, he started saying he would even put me on his life insurance policy, so when he died, I could get the money. After soothing him like this for a while, I asked him again if he could take the zip ties off me now. He pulled to the side of the road and pulled out a mini pocket knife from his car keys. He then cut them off me. It took a few tries because of how tightly he'd bound me. He gave me my phone back as well. I had an Apple watch on my wrist and asked him for it after noticing he'd snatched that in the struggle too. He had this surprised look on his face and said, well, we need to go back and get it. He turned around and started heading back to where all this had just happened at. I guess it had been dropped in the struggle. I got so scared. I thought to myself, after all that, this is it. I'm going to die here and nobody will know until somebody finds my body. Once we got there, he told me to stay in the truck. He got out and searched the ditch for my watch. He came back after five minutes and said he couldn't find it, but he would go back in the morning to look when it was light outside. We got back to the highway and headed back to town. Once we got back to town, he asked me, what do you want to do now? Like nothing had ever happened. I said, bring me to my mom's house. I have work in four hours and I'm really tired. It was 4.30 a.m. by this time. He did bring me back to my mom's, thankfully. After getting to my mom's house, I looked up his name on Google. I didn't know it, but apparently he was on parole for first-degree murder. He had killed someone before for their life insurance policy. I'm 22 now, and I'm thankful I got to see another day. I had to testify against him, and he was found guilty November 6th of 2023 of all the charges he was accused of. As of now, he hasn't quite been sentenced yet, though. Summer of 2004, my family was supposed to vacation somewhere in Maine. My father was stuck in work and meetings though, so he was going to come up from Manhattan a few days after us. My mom wanted to drive up there for whatever reason, super annoying to me at the time, but we didn't really have a choice. My brother, sister, and I loaded into the car, and we started the long drive. I was about 14 at the time. The drive was fairly uneventful, but there were various delays, and we ended up arriving a lot later than originally planned. Because of this, the owners of the house we were renting had already turned in for the night, and we weren't able to get a hold of them to get the keys. Sounds like horrible planning, but apparently they were pretty strict about the time frame to pick them up. My mom decided she wanted some lobster, so we went out to one of our favorite spots. She called my dad to see if he could make us some reservations at a hotel while we ate and enjoyed the lobster. While we were eating, a guy came up and started chatting with my mom. I figured it was just a friendly local, making some conversation. During this, my dad called my mom, and my mom excused herself to speak to him. Apparently, all the hotels were booked for the night. Go figure. The plan was for us to drive to the nearest town now and find anywhere to stay until we could pick up the keys for the vacation home the next day. Apparently, the local had been listening in on my mom's conversation, though, and came back over when she got off the phone. I want to say there was nothing outwardly off about him. He was very preppy, clean-cut, and unassuming. He'd fit in perfectly with any other normal person. He told my mom he had a big home with a big guest house and we were more than welcome to stay. 
he and his wife wouldn't mind at all. No way were we just going to be staying in some random guy's house in Maine in the dark. No offense to anyone from Maine, but it can get very creepy when it's dark out there. My mom did her due diligence and tried to determine if this guy was legit. He said he was in finance and my mom was an investment banker, so she interrogated him a bit. It was enough for my mom to determine he wasn't totally full of shit. I called my dad myself, hysterical about the prospect of staying with this random guy. He said I was overreacting and that I needed to get out of the city more and accept that sometimes people are just nice. My brother, sister, and I got into our car and followed this guy back to his house. The guest house actually was really nice. Fully furnished and everything, but the beds were sort of oddly placed. The guest house had two bedrooms, and instead of the beds being located in the middle and centered, imagine a symmetrical room layout where they were each right under the window in each room. It just seemed really weird. Anyway, fast forward. We're all getting ready to go to bed when my mom hears a knock at the door. It's the guy. He said he just wanted to check and make sure we were all settled in. What a nice thing to do. About 30 minutes later, he comes back to check in again. At this point, my mom was like, thanks, we're good. We'll stop by the house in the morning to say thank you. Fast forward another 30 to 45 minutes and I couldn't sleep at all. I was terrified. I kept hearing this weird rustling noise, which was fairly odd because the guest house was nowhere around trees or in close proximity to bushes that might cause such a noise to happen. At this point, I looked over and saw my mom was wide awake too. She was motioning at the window with her eyes. Let me add that none of the windows had curtains at all. The guy said it was because his wife was in the process of redecorating. When I looked up to where my mom was looking though, I could see a male figure was just standing at the window looking inside. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I don't know how long he had been there for. When he walked away, my mom waited for a bit, then told us to grab our stuff together. She wasn't messing around. We had my dad on the phone at this point, and he was pretty much flipping out at my mom about something. I didn't hear what they were arguing over though. Mom said she was going to put the stuff in the car and to follow her out. This was around 2 a.m. or so. When we got into the car, we pulled around to the front of the main house so my mom could return the key and say goodbye. However, when we went to the front, all the lights were off. Not just all the lights, but it almost looked like no one had been home at all. The porch light, the table lamp, and the front windows, everything was pitch black. Also, the two cars were gone as well. The local's car and what we presumed to be his wife's car. After seeing this, my mom was pretty unsettled. She said we were leaving right now. We proceeded to drive to the gate at the end of the driveway, only to find it had been dead bolted and locked shut from the inside. It wasn't a super strong gate though, so my dad said we should just ram it. We were in a big SUV after all. We just drove straight through it and right back to New York City, not speaking the entire time. We've never returned to Maine after, and my parents refused to speak about it again. I asked a family member if they knew why my parents refused to talk about it. I asked him when he was drunk so he might be more willing to let some things slip. All he said was they didn't tell us that the actual owners of the house were on vacation. I'm assuming my parents followed up with the local authorities to figure that out, but they never told us. I don't know who that man was or what was planned for that evening. I am curious as to whether there were any known serial killers or murderers in the area at the time, whether traveling or staying there. My mom owns her own business and works extremely hard. This means she spends many late nights sitting on the living room floor with her work sprawled out all around her. One night back in 2003, she had her typical routine going, sorting through paperwork and making piles. 
It was close to midnight on a Wednesday, so when the phone suddenly rang, she was a bit surprised. My dad worked third shift at a factory, so she assumed it must be him. When she answered the phone, though, there was no reply, just lots of heavy breathing on the other end. Admittedly creeped out, she hung up and called my dad. He told her it was not him that called, and she left it at that. Keep in mind this was almost 15 years ago, and we lived in a small town with practically no crime whatsoever. We never locked our doors, and we were never scared of dangerous people either. After that initial call though, the phone calls started to come in every night, then multiple times a night. The person on the other end started talking eventually too. He started by saying, Hello, Diane. You're so beautiful. I'd love to meet you. Things quickly escalated after, with him going into graphic detail of how he wanted to essay and strangle her. Of course, she stopped answering the phone, and she informed the police as well, but nothing was ever done about it. The phone would continue to ring every night onward. My parents weren't in the situation where my dad could stay home from work, and my mom truly believed the calls were just empty threats, so things continued on that way. That was until one night, when he got brave. My mom was sitting on the floor in front of our huge mirrored cabinet, with all of her work spread out around her. When the phone rang this time, she ignored it, as she had started to do. She was concentrating hard on a piece of paper in front of her when a glimmer of light in the mirror caught her eye. She looked up to see a pair of eyeglasses peering at her in the reflection. She spun around to face the front door, which her back had been turned to. There was a man standing there, just staring at her. She said they both stared at each other for what felt like forever until she saw the doorknob start to turn. She started screaming, and the man quickly ran away. In light of this happening, my parents started locking all the doors, which was a totally foreign concept to this area. My older brother, who was about 17 at the time, was aware of the phone calls as well. He came running down the stairs with a baseball bat, but the man was already long gone. When the police came, they scoured our property, and came across close to 200 cigarette butts right underneath our living room windows. They were all hidden behind the bushes. Apparently, he had been watching her for weeks on end. The police also happened to find a bike tire trail coming from the windows and going down to the sidewalk. The police took the cigarette butts and did DNA testing on them. They were able to match them to a convicted rapist who lived on the street. Robert Hahn was arrested while riding his bike. He went to prison for menacing an attempt to commit a crime. He had many priors, so we assumed he would be locked up for quite some time. The reason I'm telling this story is because he was recently released from prison. This is a short story about something that none of us who saw it could explain. I've been working in the same electronics store for about a year now. It's a pretty big one, with two different floors. We sell just about everything. Household appliances, computers, TVs, cell phones, cables, vacuum cleaners, you name it. We sell everything here. It's always been a fairly normal job, and nothing odd has ever happened as long as I've been there. I've never heard any stories about anything out of the ordinary, no crimes really, or ghosts or anything like that. I mean, it is a store, so we do get robbed from time to time, but mostly it's just peaceful living. I came to think of it as fairly normal too. That was until about a month ago. Usually, I work the closing shift. We close the store at around 8 p.m. After closing, there's three of us that have to stay behind until 8.30, just in case someone tries to get in after closing, or someone stays behind or something. One salesman, one doorman, and the cashier. 
The cashier is me. Nobody had ever tried to get in after hours since I started working here, but it is policy, so we had to stay anyway. About a month ago, I was making sure that all the customers were out of the store. I was doing my routine little closing procedure. I'd closed down the counter at about 8.20. I counted all the money and put everything back in the safe. I got up and went downstairs to the stock room. Like I said, normally we would be the only three people there at this point, but as I went in, I was surprised to find a group of my co-workers all gathered around the surveillance monitors. I could hear them muttering something like, What? She's still here? They usually do a thorough check before we start locking up everything, so needless to say, I was very surprised. I went up to this group of people gathered around and decided to take a look for myself. I could see that there was indeed a still a woman there who was walking around the ground floor of the store looking at stuff in the pitch black darkness. One of my co-workers went back out onto the floor to talk to her and tell her that the store was closed and she had to leave right now. We saw her react to the sound of the staff room door opening and running off into the darkness. He came back a while later and told us that he couldn't find her anywhere. He had looked around everywhere and even yelled out for her, but there was nothing to be found. At this time, we couldn't find her on any of the monitors anymore, so we decided to go out and look for her, all but one of us. This big group of 11 people split up, with 5 people searching on each floor. One stayed behind in the staff room to keep an eye on the monitors. We searched the entire area for what felt like forever, but we all came back empty-handed. She just wasn't there. We discussed if there was any way she could have gotten out, but both the entrance and exits were locked already, and anywhere else you could get out at needed a keycard to access, and a personal code as well. We checked the staff room too, just to make sure she hadn't snuck in there while we were gone, but she was nowhere to be found. The guy who'd monitored the cameras hadn't seen or heard anything since we left either. It was an insanely creepy experience, and we were all going nuts. If there was no one there, then who the hell did we just see in the monitors? We clearly saw her, and she reacted to the sound of us going out as well. So, I had a weird experience that I just can't resist sharing. This is a true story. Hopefully, I'll update it if anything new occurs. I live in a historical dorm building in the Northwest, here in the USA, living on the fifth floor of this hundred-year-old structure with no elevator I might add. The building is shaped kind of like a U, and my windows face another dorm room across the way. I've been sleeping like a night owl recently, going to bed around 3 a.m. and waking up at 10 for class. I'd never met my neighbor across the way, never even made eye contact with them really. He was a male and he had heavy curtains he always closed shut at dusk. They would be open when I woke up. Today I woke up really early, awoken by a weird dream I couldn't quite seem to remember. I sat up in my bed. My bed faces the window across. I could see the window of my neighbor directly in front of me. I had some things sitting in my window sill, so I couldn't see all of their apartment, and they couldn't really see into mine either. My windows were also always fogged up. I liked it that way though, so no one could take a peek inside. At one point, I woke up feeling groggy in the night when I saw movement in the window across the way. I could see my neighbor opening their curtains, so somewhat instinctively I hid. They couldn't see me watching them, but I could see what they were doing. He opened his curtains almost like something from a dramatic movie, both hands splitting them apart down the middle. This is where things got a bit weird, though. After he opened the window's curtains, he just kind of stood there like he was frozen. I watched him out of the corner of my window. He wasn't making eye contact, so he didn't seem to know I was there. 
He was just kind of staring into my room. I sat there as well, and we both stayed like that for five minutes. Suddenly, he broke his gaze, turned away, and walked out of my view. I stayed in bed for a while, but I was still very tired. It was about 7 a.m. I was thinking, what just happened? I got up and made some coffee, then sat back down in bed and watched some YouTube videos to get my mind off that weird experience. I chilled out and forgot about that weirdness. At the start of my day officially though, once more light began to pour in, I caught a glimpse of something in my window. I looked up and noticed there were three streak marks that had definitely not been there earlier this morning. With my windows being fogged up all the time, probably from the heat inside my room and the humidity outside, I realized that these were the marks of someone's fingers on the window pane. I had been watching my neighbor that morning. They were in the upper corner of the window, so nobody could touch this area easily. I realized that those marks were in the same place my neighbor had been staring at this morning. I pushed the thought out of my mind and went back to finishing my coffee. I couldn't help but look again though after I got up to put my coffee cup away in the kitchen. As I passed by the window, I noticed a new development. There were now streak marks coming from the top of the finger marks on my window and dragging across the entire thing. I immediately called my mom. She freaked out. There must have been an intruder. I reassured her though that no one had been in my room. Not that I had noticed at least. She asked if they were from the outside or inside of my window. I went up and slowly slid my finger across the marks, and as I left another streak behind, I realized they had been made from the inside. She told me to clean my windows and see if it happens again. I did so, and I'll see if it occurs again. I don't really know what's going on here. It seems like maybe my neighbor saw something, or maybe they were in a trance of sorts. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll try and ask them what they saw and why they were staring. All I can say is I think it will be very hard for me to sleep tonight.